joining us and this is our sixth Patareo webinar um, and today's webinar we are focusing on managing treatment regimens and transition for children. Um, it's a little similar to the last webinar but this time what we've added is a focus on children presenting with comorbidities and really looking at some of the complexities of managing these uh, uh, comorbidities. And as we know, this can be quite challenging in our settings, quite often with limited resources to screen, to diagnose, and therefore, you know, to treat children timely. So this, could, this can be a real barrier in terms of um, HIV treatment um, for our children. So my name is Agnes Ronan. And I'm the head of programs at PATA. Hopefully you'll get to see me soon, but hello everyone. And I'll be facilitating your session uh, for this afternoon. Uh, so firstly, while we're waiting, I'm going to just uh, go through a few house rules. Firstly, we really, really would like to know who is joining us on this uh, afternoon. So if you can, we invite you to please uh, tell us your name and where you're coming from by posting in the chat box. Uh, if you watch the video, you will have seen that the chat box is, a, is an icon at the bottom of your screen. So if you uh, click on that icon, which says chat, uh, you can type your name and where you're from. Um, that would be great. And the second thing is that uh, we also have a Q&A box again at the bottom. You will uh, See, it says Q&A. During the session, please, please feel free to post any questions in that Q&A box. And if you can, please do say who your question is directed at. And then lastly, uh, just to let you know that we have translations uh, available in Portuguese and French. So if you prefer to listen in Portuguese or French, Again, please, uh, on those icons at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little globe, like a, a world globe. Uh, click on that icon and it will give you an option to select whatever language you'd like to uh, listen in. So before I introduce you to our speakers, um, they, we may have people on the panel um, in the audience who may not be familiar with Pata Real is, but I'd like to think that most of you have sat in at least one or two uh, real webinars. So uh, Pata was born out of the recognition that there really is no policy or guidance or even training that can prepare us enough for some of the real life challenges that we confront uh, in trying to do our jobs out in the facilities when we're delivering uh, uh, services. And that there's so much learning that actually comes on the job from implementation. Every day we come across interesting cases, difficult cases, and we learn as we go along. But there's not, there's not enough documentation of what we're learning or platforms to share these learnings with others in similar settings. And so for us, that is how Patareel was born. 
born. So the idea uh, behind the role webinars is to deliberately create that space for you as health providers to share and learn together. We will, um, so today we'll hear cases, uh, real cases from the front line. These are cases that have been seen by health providers like yourselves, doctors, nurses, clinic counselors, and it will be presented by the health providers who presented the cases, not us. Um, so this platform will provide us with a reality check and some and on some of the challenges and successes as well that we face on the front line. Plus, we have the added bonus of having uh, real experts on our panels, and we can and they could they can help us unpack some of these cases and look at what could have been done better, what could be done differently, or how well we did as well, so others can learn from that. And um, some of the cases you, you might listen to and you might think they don't sound necessarily sound complex, but they do reflect uh, real daily challenges for some of our frontline healthcare providers out there. Um, and some of the difficult decisions and, li and limited choices that they have as they deliver services. And um, often with limited resources or support or even minimal training. So we hope that even if you think, you know, a case is simple, we hope that from today's cases, there will be something uh, for, uh, you can identify with and something you can take away from, uh, from the experts. Slide number three, please. So before we begin, I'd like to start by welcoming our four great presenters lined up for, uh, we have presenters from Cameroon, the DRC, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. I will introduce each of them individually as they uh, come along to do their presentations. I would also like to welcome our two expert panelists to help us, who are going to help us unpack and learn from the four cases today. Um, so firstly, we have Dr. Mo Archery, uh, who many of you who have been on this webinar is not in fact both our panelists you will have met before. Uh, firstly is Dr. Mo Archery, who is a pediatrician and an HIV specialist. Um, Dr. Archery is from the King Edward VIII uh, Hospital and University of Pazulu Natal here in South Africa. And among a long list of other things, Dr. Archery also serves on PATA's technical advisory panel. Our second panelist is Dr. Pascal Atanga, all the way from Cameroon. Uh, Dr. Atanga is a senior technical advisor for HIV care and treatment for the new HIV Northwest and Southwest project. Um, and is uh, based at the Cameroon Baptist Convention uh, Health Services Center in Cameroon. Um, and then in terms of the format that we're going to, so those are our two panelists. So the format that we're going to follow is that we have, we have four cases uh, and each of the cases are different, of course. And each presenter will, pre, uh, will present and then it will be followed by uh, an expert panelist reviewing the case. Um, Dr. Tanga will be the panelist for the first two cases. And then Dr. Archery will review the last two cases. And um, so I, I really, again, would like to encourage you to make the most of the learning from each other. We really, really encourage you to ask questions. Uh, and I just wanna say, no matter how basic you think your question is, someone else will learn something, will either have the same question or learn something from it. So please keep the chat box busy and ask your questions. So I know I have lots of announcements, but just one last thing before we delve into the presentations. We would like to ask you a few questions just so we can understand what's going on out there. Um, we have three questions to ask you now, and then we'll have another uh, couple of questions later on in the presentations. So the uh, questions will come up on your screen and I'll give you a couple of minutes to respond to the questions. And then after we've done that, we'll move into our, uh, I'll introduce our first presenter. So tech team, if you could do the questions for us, please. Okay, not to worry, we can always slot the questions in somewhere else. I mean, it's not critical that we have the questions now. So what I'm gonna, oh, there we go. Spoke too early, there we go. 
please could you answer each of the uh, three questions that you can see on the screen? So the first question, I'll just read them out for those who might be on their phone and can't see. Has, excuse me, has uh, DTG been, PDTG been introduced in your country? And the options are, yes, it is available everywhere. Uh, second option is it has been rolled out in some places, but is not available in, all, in my facility or area. And third option is, I don't know, if you don't know, and the last question is uh, no, straightforward no. The second, and so I'm hoping you've all have done that by now. The second question is, have health providers in your facility been trained on when and how to transition children and adolescents living with HIV to DTG or PDTG uh, from other regimens? And here again, we have four options. You can only choose one answer. The first answer is yes, we've had all the training needed. The second question is yes, but we need more training as there are still gaps in our understanding. The third question is only some health providers have been trained and the last question is no. I'm hoping that by now we've both done question one and two. Um, can everyone see question three? Because I can only see the question, but I can't see the options, but maybe I might have a different setting to our viewers. I'm hoping everyone can see uh, the options for question three, but the question is, what is the most difficult part of transitioning children to PDTG? Um, if you can see the options, please choose your options. And hopefully everyone has had an opportunity to respond to our questions. Thank you, I can see. Um, People can see the options. Uh, someone has asked us to scroll down. I can see them, please scroll down. I, can, uh, I don't know if that's possible tech. Okay, uh, maybe we will, okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, it was probably just my screen. Okay, so everyone uh, is hopefully has had an opportunity to respond. Do we see the results now, Tech, or do I move to my next, my first presenter? It'll be great to see what we've all. There we go. So fantastic. We can see that you know uh, more than three quarters of. Uh, people in the room have had uh, say that DTG is available everywhere in, um, in their countries. What I can't tell you is how many countries these we are speaking to, but I'm, hope, I'm hoping that we have a good representation uh, from countries across the region. Uh, question number two, uh, it has been rolled out in some places, but it's not available in my facility yet. So um, I think most people uh, didn't know whether, and that's a fair answer, didn't know whether it's been rolled out to other, uh, uh, first, uh, in. oh, sorry, it has been rolled out at, in some places, but not available in my facility. Okay, I mean, um, we have more, the, most people saying that they don't know whether it's been rolled out in their facility. That's interesting. I would, hopefully after this uh, session, um, your, your, responsibilities to go and find out if it's been rolled out in our uh, uh, in your facility and then we have a few people who don't know and um, as a few people who said no in fact just one person who said no and then the last question is if health providers in your facility have been trained on when and how to transition children and adolescents living with HIV um, and the answers are Again, very good to see that nearly half of health providers who are on this platform and say, yes, we've all had training needed. 
Um, we still have over a third that says yes, but we need more training um, as there are still gaps in our understanding. So there's much work to be done. And we hope that this platform will also help in terms of uh, filling up that gap. And if not, please do get in touch with us afterwards. We will uh, try and make sure that we um, provide the right platform to support people as much as we can. And then uh, only some providers have been trained, only 15% said yes to that um, uh, response. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Really interesting to see that we still have some, some work to do in terms of PDTG, but we uh, kind of know where the gaps are now. So thank you. So I am now going to uh, introduce you to our first panelist. And uh, our first panelist is Thomas Ndosaktor. And Thomas is a nurse from Batiste Hospital Mutengene and uh, uh, all the way from Cameroon. So Thomas, over to you. Thank you so much, Agnes. Hi, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. My name is Ndosak Thomas Toa from uh, Cameroon. I'm a nurse at the Baptist Hospital Mutengene. I'm glad to present to you this case today. Next slide, please. Okay, the case I'm presenting today has the family uh, history and uh, social circumstances as follows. It's a nine-year-old child that was diagnosed at 11 months uh, old in 2014. Uh, her mother now lives with uh, her second partner, and so she had separated with the partner of the child, uh, to whom she has not even uh, disclosed her status and the child's status to the partner. As of now, we have been unable to test the partner, and so we don't yet know the status of the, of, of the partner she is living with. The mother was placed on, on treatment on ART two years after the child has started treatment. Uh, when she presented with some KS lesions and was stage WHO4. And currently she is having a suppressed viral load of uh, 269 copies as of February, 2022. Next slide, please. Okay, on the next slide, we are talking about the medical history of this child. The mother actually went through ANC and uh, during ANC, she was on PMTCT option A that she stopped uh, two weeks after delivery. And the child was actually delivered in a hospital through a cesarean section. And the child took nevirapine prophylaxis for, for, for her month. And the, this child was actually misfect, missed uh, follow, uh, mixed feeding, uh, which we were not quite uh, okay with it. The child was diagnosed uh, at age 11 months of, by PCR, uh, PCR. And so normally we missed out the six weeks PCR because the mother couldn't show up uh, for follow-up visit. And so she, when the child was sick, the mother brought the child to the hospital at nine months. And at that nine months, we had to collect a, an emergency PCR. And two months after the PCR came back to be positive. And immediately the, child, the, the PCR came out positive. The child was actually placed on treatment and was stage WHO3. Next slide, please. What we have done so far in order to help this child and the mother by eight years of old of, for this child, the child has been partially disclosed to. And as of now, the child knows that she is living with a germ inside of her. We are working closely with the mother and the child to, to, to move to naming the, 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 the germ. And uh, the child had had repeated high viral load, uh, which, which prompted us to, to, to to do home visits to, to the mother and find out what was actually going on back at home. Uh, and when we reached home, we noticed that the child was being left with the neighbors who never knew the status of the child and the child was not being given the treatment when the child is supposed to be given the treatment. The mother and the child have undergone several EACs, enhanced adherence counseling, to ensure that she has a suppressed viral load and she had equally been uh, referred to the social services for psychological support to be offered. And we actually emphasize on direct observed therapy uh, in order to see whether we can have uh, a suppressed viral loop. Next slide, please. 
Okay, the clinical uh, evaluation and treatment follow up for this uh, child in April 2014, the child, when the child started treatment after a PCR, a positive PCR test, the weight of the child was 5.5 kg. Hemoglobin at that uh, level was 10.4 grams per deciliter, and the child was placed on AZT, 3TC, Lopinavir, Ritonavir. Nine months after, that was in January 2015, the, the child's weight actually improved to 9.3 kg. Uh, the hemoglobin level also went up to 13.9. Uh, the child was still on the same regimen as of initiation. And this time around, we were opportune to check the CD, CD4 count levels of the child and it was actually up at 1,500. Uh, by March 2016, we repeated the hemoglobin and it, it still went up. We still had the opportunity to repeat the CD4 count. And this time around, the CD4 count of the child actually dropped and the child was actually at 11 months, uh, whether, uh, weighing 11 kg. The child has been presenting with recurrent episodes of uh, unproductive cough as, as of that March 2016 up to uh, 2020. Um, December 2017, we had an opportunity to do the very first viral load for this child and the child was and the results came back very high, 170,000 copies. The child was still on the regimen at initiation. We offered EAC and nine months later, we went right up to nine months because the mother was not respecting clinic appointments. We deemed that the EACs were uh, good and we repeated the viral load and it dropped down to, to 86 copies, still very high. We continued with uh, enhanced adherence counseling and the child actually suppressed after uh, some time in June, 2019. And uh, by February, 2020, we were out of stock of AZT3TC and we had to place the child on ABC3TC Lopina V. And thinking that the child was already suppressed and she was to do her next viral load in November, 2020, following the national algorithm, when we did the viral load this time around, it went up to 260 something copies, uh, showing that the child was unsuppressed. Uh, we follow up through EACs and repeated the viral load uh, sometime in September 2021. And the instead of reducing, the viral load continuously went up. And this time around, the child was already on ABC 3TC effervescence because we ran out of stock of uh, Lopinavi, Ritonavi. This actually prompted us to pay the child a home visit before we noticed what was uh, going on back at home. From this December 20, uh, 20, uh, December 2017 up till September uh, 2021, uh, the child's weight has been fluctuating between 13 kgs and 19 kilograms. And so when we had the stock of DTG 15, by November 2021, when the child uh, weight increased to uh, 20 kg, we immediately switched the child or we immediately optimized the child to ABC 3TC DTG and follow uh, the child through uh, EACs emphasizing on directly observed therapy. And as of March 2022, the viral load of the child uh, reduced to 315 copies as of uh, now. Next slide, please. The challenges we have faced with this uh, uh, case is that the mother was unable to attend clinic uh, rendezvous due to some financial constraints and the mother hasn't disclosed to anyone else when the only person she had disclosed to was the junior sister who died a year ago and since then she has not disclosed to anyone even the current partner she is living with she has not disclosed and we were we have been unable to test the partner as of today the child was not actually placed on a Tazanavi that is moved to second line after a repeated high viral load because of the weight of the child and the age of the child. The national guidelines did not permit us to move the child to a Tazanavi. Following of this, this case, we actually noticed that if, uh, we dis if disclosure is done to more than one family relations, one trusted family relation, it can actually help in, in, in compliance to treatment. The child has not yet been full, 
any child that has not been fully disclosed to, uh, we emphasize on directly observed uh, therapy in, in order to ensure Thomas, are you there? Okay, I think we may have lo lost Thomas. Okay, and I think uh, the last point that Thomas was just going to make around the key challenges, if I'm correct, was that um, the child could not be, uh, or a, a child could not be placed on uh, on ATVR as his weight did not permit per national guidelines. Um, and so I am going to. I'm just waiting to see if Thomas can come back so he can finish his presentation. If not. Okay, yeah, so uh, I think Thomas had dropped up his points around uh, uh, mom not attending, unable to attend clinic, mother not having disclosed, weight child were the main challenges that they faced. And then in terms of what they learn themselves, that disclosure is important. And then I think quite importantly, that second um, point there is, uh, uh, maximum family support is, is needed and that directly uh, observed therapy can be a helpful strategy to ensure adherence, not only because the child takes a medication while you're watching, but mother and child in the process will learn the importance of uh, taking medication. And that also knowing the family circumstances is important um, in terms of providing uh, person-centered counseling because when you see that child in the facility and you don't know what the home, home circumstances, we tend to, you know, sometimes it's difficult to give them, up, them appropriate counseling that's going to help their situation. So that wraps up um, Thomas's presentation and the key questions, next slide, please. And the key questions that Thomas had for the uh, panelists, Dr. Tanga, this is to you. Do we see the improvements? So there was an initial improvement in viral load. Um, do we see the improvements in viral load suggestive of a response to DTG? Um, and then Thomas also wanted to know what did they do right? What, what could they uh, have done better? And that then in 2016, they didn't screen for TB as they did not have uh, lamp strips what uh, wanted to know what are other ways one can test for TB and initiate treatment if, um, if the child was found positive. So what else could be done in the absence of um, testing um, devices or uh, uh, strips? And, um, and then lastly, what could be the way forward for this child? So Dr. Atanga, I'll hand that over to you. Is anyone getting Agnes? I can't get her from my end. Okay, Dr. Atanga, can you see the questions on the screen? I can, I can, I can. I didn't get you for some time, so I was wondering what was happening. Okay, we lost. Yes, yeah, so we lost Thomas. So the questions we have on the screen are the questions that Thomas had for you as a uh, uh, an expert, are you able to speak to those questions? Okay, uh, I think, uh, thank you for handing me the floor, uh, Agnes. And I, I really hope uh, uh, the Thomas should be able to join us to, to get, uh, might be the, the few contributions that we had to make uh, on the, the case that uh, he presented from their hospital. So I, I, I think uh, Thomas presented a nine-year-old female diagnosed at 11 months. Uh, mother was also currently on ART, uh, virally suppressed. But I just wanted to make uh, uh, clear this, that uh, you know the patient was virally suppressed at uh, 269 uh, copies. 
uh, that's not good enough to be used as a measure for the U equal U. Uh, and so not being able to disclose to the partner and, uh, and let him also know and check his own status or participate in index case testing is uh, risky because uh, there is still a very high risk for this uh, client uh, transmitting to the partner. Uh, the, the, the other sibling of the child was negative. I think that was a, a good follow up uh, that the team did. So I'll actually start with uh, his uh, first, uh, his second question, which uh, talks about uh, uh, what they do, they, what uh, they did not do right. I, I think uh, that uh, the team did a great job uh, for promptly uh, initiating. Uh, uh, this patient on treatment, I think that was uh, quite uh, quite good. And uh, the the diagnosis of the child was done, and uh, they, they they also started it. I think I, I also saw that the, their child was on a uh, so uh, that was uh, also uh, well done. Uh, I think the, the, the follow-up was uh, good, and uh, along the line, uh, they even went ahead uh, to do home visit, which is very, very necessary at times to understand the circumstances, which it actually mentioned was a lesson they learned, uh, which the patient uh, lives in. And most importantly, uh, the, the socioeconomic background and uh, the, 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 the circumstances around the, the patient's drug taking. I think uh, knowing that was very, very important. And I think it helped uh, the team to do a better follow-up for the child. Uh, they equally did uh, psychosocial support and which alongside uh, there was also intervention of uh, social workers. I think uh, that was very, very uh, good work that was done. I also rec uh, recommend, uh, the, the, I mean, commend their efforts to propose DOT, that's direct observed therapy, for some of this for this child because at times it becomes very very necessary to see that the child is uh, actually following treatment but then uh somebody's actually seeing the child swallowing the tab and that could really be a good measure of adherence other than just counting the pills at the end of the day uh what uh, they couldn't do i just think that um, uh, the question uh, two and three, I would just, uh, four, three and four, I would just put that together to mention a few things that they could have done. And uh, uh, one of the things that was made mention was that the child was malnourished. And uh, we know very well, this is a very critical uh, uh, problem with children uh, infected with HIV, especially living in in poor socioeconomic conditions, uh, they are usually malnourished. And now uh, when these children are not, uh, malnutrition is not properly handled, this is also another uh, very important factor to increasing the immune uh, depression and again, uh, leading to more opportunistic infections. And so I would have I loved, I would have thought that the team would have actually uh, tell us exactly uh, how they did diagnose the moderate malnutrition, what were the anthropometric measures that uh, they were using. And I think along the case presentation, we didn't really see uh, how this was followed up. And I, I think uh, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will think that the team should actually try to put more emphasis on this, on monitoring uh, uh, the, the, the nutritional status of the child using simple anthropometric measures. I think this is a, a young a young child, and I think uh, even the mid upper arm circumference, which is a very simple tool uh, for managing classification, for can be used, and that can actually help them to better monitor their child. As they rightly said, they were not able to do; uh, they didn't properly investigate their child for TB uh, in 2016. I I really want to think that uh, in most of the facilities, uh, TB lamb. Uh, is, uh, is, is recent and uh, most facilities don't really have access to TB lamp, but the classical uh, uh, WHO uh, screening uh, can be done. And in children, uh, making sure that uh, we also check uh, the notions of contact, but then uh, they could equally uh, actually uh, 
uh, had done uh, other uh, uh, TB investigations for this child, even they didn't have the TB lab. I think uh, uh, a child at that age of, I mean, at that age was about four, and I think uh, they could have uh, uh, done, uh, get a gastric lavage, they could do gastric lavage to get uh, a fluid that could be used either for zeal nursing staining or for gene expert. Most of these facilities, most facilities around uh, have access to gene expert. They have access uh, to, to, to Z nursing staining. And so the most important thing was to collect the right sample and gastric lavage could be very, very uh, useful in this case. Uh, they could also get sputum uh, by uh, induction uh, using warm saline. And I think uh, that could also be a method to get good uh, sput uh, uh, samples for Z nursing testing or a gene expert. At least, I think, uh, in a facility like the one when uh, NOSA works, might be they have access to, uh, uh, to an egg, a chest X-ray. So uh, a plain chest X-ray could have been done for this child. And I think uh, those are the few investigations that they could have done in addition to thinking just about uh, the, uh, the, TV, the LF lamp. LF lamp is quite useful, especially in children, because uh, sput um, at times sputum production is uh, difficult and uh, a simple urine lamb will be important. But without that, we can actually do other, uh, other things. And then uh, coming back to his first question, which uh, talks about improvement with uh, viral load uh, suggestive of response to DTG. I think uh, uh, when you look at the transitions that have been done for this child, that's uh, more going from uh, uh, AZT 3TC Lopirito to ABC 3TC Effervorance and then now to ABC 3TC uh, DTG, I think a lot of transition, uh, the, the changes have taken place. And at times, uh, what uh, WHO actually recommend today is that when a child on first line ART presents with an elevated viral load and is not already on a DTG containing regimen, the child could immediately be switched to a DTG uh, containing regimen uh, and then that child can be put on uh, uh, EAC. I think uh, that is what they did and so uh, that was perfect. But then you know, one of the things that they also need to note is that a child who has been on treatment uh, for almost uh, uh, eight years has been going through several transitions. There's a very high risk of this child, uh, child accumulating uh, uh, some uh, resist, uh, resistances. So the, the, the other, the fear that we might have here is that the observed uh, virus suppression that we are seeing could uh, be, uh, let this not just be uh, some uh, res um, I mean, uh, response to the presence of DTG. And uh, at times uh, that is uh, a, a very risky because then you just have a response to a single regimen. And if that is the case, there is a high risk that we can observe a rebound because at 300, we are not very, very sure. And there's a possibility that some of these children might eventually develop, uh, 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 they might eventually develop uh, resistance like at, uh, some time resistance, that's uh, time within uh, analog um, mutations. And if they had developed those resistance, one of the things that this team should be looking forward to is to, to see how to increase uh, adherence uh, for this child, uh, that's a reinforced adherence to this child. And if the child happens to get to a weight uh, greater than uh, 30 kgs and uh, greater than uh, 10 years, they should envisage moving this child immediately to, uh, to TLD, because there they would have actually changed the, the backbone because Right now, you see that they've, they've exhausted most of the pediatric backbones, ABC3T, uh, ABC3TC, AZT3TC. And now the only backbone that is left with them is Tenofovir, um, uh, 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 Lamivudine. 
and uh, that cannot also be introduced too early because the child is not yet of age. And also to note that uh, it, it, I mean, they, there is no need to, uh, worrying about whether the child should have been moved to Atazanavi or not. Atazanavi will not perform better than Lopiritonavi. And that child was already on Lopiritonavi, even being moved to, to DTG. So uh, they should have, there should be no worry as to whether that child could have gone to Atazanavi, even though the, the, uh, the, the child was not yet of age as recommended by the guidelines. So uh, one of the biggest challenges that this case presents is, uh, is actually a problem of adherence, which uh, the, the team noted, but then uh, they have to continue counseling the mother to, to see how to get her disclosed to the partner and get the partner tested. Because that is the only way that uh, if this happens and uh, everything works well, then uh, this mother will be able to administer treatment to the child under uh, conditions that uh, will be much better than what we currently observe. I even wonder how our team, the team managed to, to, to do home visit uh, in the situation where the um, uh, disclosure was still very, very challenging. And so I think uh, they really need to work towards disclosure or else this child might not be in the right, the, the, a better condition to, 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 to actually uh, uh, get to virus suppression with the current uh, regimen. So the only risk that we run is actually the risk of uh, uh, DTG, uh, uh, actually a mono uh, uh, drug situation, if in case the backbone already had a problem of resistance, but then, uh, they should continue observing the child, and uh, if they have the opportunity to get to, to 30 kgs, uh, they should change the child from AZ to, 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 to Tenofovir, because because that, that would be the only molecule, once you have already uh, developed a series of terms, that would be the only molecule that will be better if AZ cannot, if AZ cannot more be used, even though there is a risk of cross resistance once you have uh, uh, times, uh, times have uh, already developed. But then even in that case, amongst the two molecules, the only molecule that can be left uh, once the, the, you have uh, uh, multi-drug resistance is when is to leave the, to, to get uh, AZT off and then introduce uh, uh, Tenofovir. V. So uh, that was the little I had to, to, to share with the team. I hope, yeah. well, they, they, they had the opportunity to, to follow us and might be okay. there's something that they learned from it. Thank you and over Agnes. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Hatanga. I'm sorry to have to interrupt you there, but my gosh, so much to learn. And I'm sure uh, I'm hoping that Thomas is back on and team, but others as well. There's so much to take away from that. Uh, Thomas, if you're back on, I know uh, he's having problems staying on, but Zandila, we've noted your questions. Thomas will either answer them in the chat or we will um, somehow get back to you. But thank you for all, uh, all your really uh, your three really interesting questions. So thanks for that. And now I'm going to swiftly move over to our next presenter. Um, I'd like to introduce our next presenter and our next presenter is Martha. Martha Amuso. Martha is from uh, is a registered nurse from Tiriri Healthcare Center in Soroti. Uh, over to you, Martha. Thank you very much, Agnes. It's a pleasure for me to take this time to present this case as pertaining my facility. I'm called Amuso Mata from Tiriri Health Center 4, Soroti in Uganda. Next slide. I'm presenting a 14-year-old female girl diagnosed with HIV at two years. That was in 2010. The child was diagnosed at two years in August 2020. The child had been disclosed to, and the child goes to school. She's living in a household of low economic status with both parents. 
who are also living positive. And she's, she's so far the youngest child. We've done the index testing to all the other siblings and they are negative. Next slide. Next slide. On clinical evaluation and current challenges. The child presented with the recurring cough in August 2018 and was treated for TB. For two months, he was on rifampicin, isoniazid, parazinamine, and ethambutol. And for the four months, was on rifampicin and isoniazid. Since then, the child had a continuous cough up to death, irritating and very dry. The child has stunted growth and presents with the acute malnutrition, presently has a mark of 17 centimeters, which is tagged yellow, and that is a moderate acute malnutrition. After the completion of TB treatment, client was started on INH, isoniazid, to, pre to prevent the TB from recurring and regular screening for TB every clinic visit. Nutritional counseling has been provided to the caretakers. Chronic viral load non suppression continued. And for that, he led us to start home based e accessions, that is, intensive adherence counseling, and then the CD4 monitored. Every time she presents with the cough, we do a gene expert urine tibulum, which has always turned negative. Next slide. Can you see your slides, Martha? Yes, we had from. Yeah, they're clear now. Yes. In August, faint. I'm becoming faint. No, we can hear you. The slides are faint. Okay. In August 2010, the child presented with the oral ulcer, cough, had persist that had persisted for one month, severe swelling on umbilical. Stamp. My slide is so faint again. Try to balance some light. Okay. Sorry, I'll try and read for you, Martha. I hope I'll get it right. Let me know when your slides are better and you can pick up. Uh, but what we heard was that in 2010, the child presented with oral ulcers, cough, and had uh, and cough persisted for one month, swelling of the umbilical stump, low weight to uh, age um, was only seven kilograms, and persistent fever. Uh, laboratory uh, investigations include a, a rapid HIV test, which tested positive and was initiated on cortrimoxazole. In 2011, a uh, child presented again with recurrent cough um, and HB was taken at the time and was 9.3, CD4 count was 406 cells. And the child was then started on ART, which was AZT, 3TC and efavirenz. Um, 2013, the facility had run out of stock when the child presented, and therefore the child was switched to AZT, 3TC, and Nevarapin. And then in 20, September 2016, which is three years later, um, not sure if we're missing some information there, but three years later, viral load uh, was 2,855 copies. July 2017, a year later, viral load had gone up slightly to 3,548 copies. In May 2018, client had a continuous cough recurring again, and viral load was high. Uh, it's over 19,000. Um, treatment at the time was uh, Abacavir, 3TC, and Ephebrins, and Neverapin 
was sub substituted with effervorins because the drug uh, because of drug interaction, um, rifampicin uh, of drug interaction, rifampicin nevirapin when the client was started on TB treatment. So there was interaction between, uh, sorry, rifampicin and nevirapin. Uh, in 20, June 2018, the child was started on uh, three ABC, three TC, and effervorins, and uh, an anti TB treatment. And then uh, a few uh, a year later, April 2019, uh, client still had persistent cough and stunted growth and moderate acute malnutrition. Uh, his uh, MUAC was only 17 centimeters uh, on the yellow uh, band. And um, viral load was over 11,000 in April 2019. And uh, in uh, April 2020, a year later, was over 35,000. So had shot up. Um, he was, uh, so when in 2019, uh, my apologies for that. <laughs> in 2019, when his viral load was over 11,000, the child was switched to AZT, 3TC, Lepernovir, and uh, a second line. But then when he came back in 2020, his viral load had shot up to 35,000 to over 35,000. And then in July 2021, viral load had come down uh, to 883. And uh, this was while he was still on the AZT, 3TC, and Lepenovir. But then they switched the uh, child to AZT, 3TC for Optima and uh, DTG for optimization. Um, and then, uh, so, but then in January, when he came back in January, 2022, after having been on, on the optimi uh, optimized treatment, his uh, viral load had gone up to 6,789 copies. Um, and he's just had a viral load done now, which of which we don't have a result. Uh, next slide, please. Martha, can you see that slide? Are you happy to carry on or would you like me to carry on? Yeah, it, it's, it's not clear. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, what we have learned from this case, after all that the child has gone through and we've tried all we could, even after switching, things were still not doing well. We had to plan for enhanced, an enhanced home-based home counseling, providing an opportunity for health providers to understand the clients home setup, observe the home environment and the potential obstacles to adherence. For example, pill balances, we are able to, help, we are, we are able to count the, pill, the pills that could have remained in the house, medical storage, available food, the safety of the immediate environment, because most times these children undergo stigma and discrimination even from the neighborhood. And even understanding the child's social life, this will enable health providers to provide appropriate patient-centered counseling. Next slide. Yeah, here comes the questions. Persistent cough after the intervention taken to resolve the question, the cough. The first question, how should this cough be managed? In 2018, this cough was treated as clinically diagnosed TB. After the gene expert turning negative, and ever since, even TB lamb has never turned positive. Non-suppression, non-suppressive viral load after transitioning to DTG is another challenge. And the question comes, the client suppressed on intensive adherence counseling sessions with the azt 3 t silopina varotonava On transitioning to DTG after six months of being on DTG, viral results returned non-suppressed. Where, where could the problem be? The other next question, some clients are still becoming unsuppressed even after being transitioned to DTG, despite having been suppressed before. What could the cause of this? 
Amazing. Thank you, Martha. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, I see we have a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A and Dr. Archery is responding to Samson's question. So Samson, hang fire your first question. And the second is more of a comment. So I will hand over to Dr. Atanga. Dr. Atanga, if I can just give you, we realize that we need more time for these cases. If I could just give you no more than five minutes to respond to Martha's questions, that would be great. Can I hand over to you, please, Dr. Atanga? Dr. Atanga, are you there? If not, Dr. Archery, can I put Hello? you on? Yeah, okay. Thank are you. Are you getting me? Yes. Okay. I was just saying that uh, we are just uh, from listening to a very, very challenging, but very interesting case uh, that uh, Mata has just presented. I thank Mata and team uh, for putting this uh, very, very uh, interesting case together. And uh, I just want to highlight uh, one thing uh, first. Um, the first thing we observe in this case is that these are cases that were, were actually diagnosed uh, 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 early on uh, when the, the guidelines at that time did not uh, uh, warrant early ART initiation. So these patients, most of them delayed uh, ART initiation, which I was diagnosed in 2000. And and 10 and uh, was so, uh, I was mean, also in 2010 you will see there the guidelines they had to wait 12 months to to start treatment and uh, uh, by then the, 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 the CD4 had to drop uh, significantly for them to start treatment those are some of the things that we we note and uh, we'll see how they, they affect uh, the, the the case so uh, the child is currently 14 years old uh, diagnosed at two and uh, both parents are also living with HIV uh, under very uh, uh, low socioeconomic uh, conditions. And uh, we also note uh, TB treatment for this patient on the basis of uh, just a clinical diagnosis. But one of the things that I want to actually note uh, with this facility is that uh, uh, they seem to really be one of the facilities that uh, it's rarely seen in our context with the 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 the, the, the state of the art of uh, I mean uh, investigations that they can do. It's very rare to find facilities today that can do CD4 counts in our context, doing a crack for crypto, doing TB lamb for patients, gene expert X-rays. Uh, they have viral loads and they are able to also uh, collect samples because this patient has been bled for resistant testing. So I think this facility has all what it takes to really uh, manage the patient and uh, manage the patient well. And the, the team did a great job. So uh, looking at her question, the first question is around the persistent cough. I think uh, the, 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 the persistent cough uh, that we observe in this patient is something that uh, needs to be carefully uh, uh, looked at. And uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, I will actually want to note here is that, uh, you know, uh, research has actually shown that uh, lung function in HIV infected children is generally compromised when compared to uh, HIV uh, uh, on infected counterparts. This is even uh, more for HIV-infected children who may have delayed ARV uh, uh, the treatment, as was the case with children who were diagnosed uh, before the test and treat era. And I think this is, a, this is, a, this is exactly the type of case that uh, uh, Mata is presenting to us here. This patient's treatment was delayed. And uh, so we have a lot of, so the HIV infected children and adolescents in high prevalence of lung impairment, predominantly irreversible, uh, low, uh, lower airway obstructions leading to persistent cough in these children. So one of the, some of the studies actually show that, you know, these children with, uh, who live with HIV, they also have a very, very high risk of uh, lung impairment and predominantly presenting as irreversible lower airway obstructions. And at times, most of the patients will present uh, with uh, a, a chronic cough. And at times, what you note from this is that uh, most of the times, even with the investigations that have been done, like the case that uh, Mata has just presented to us here, 
they might the teams might still end up uh, over treating the children for TV, where in whereas they actually don't have uh, TV. In, the, in another very recent study in Southern Africa, uh, the authors demonstrated that about 30% of African HIV infected children have chronic respiratory symptom, symptoms. Classically, uh, this is also presented as a, as a chronic cough. So what we actually seen in this case is not uh, very, very uh, unusual. And uh, I think uh, one of the things that our uh, listeners should be, learning, we should be learning is that this is, very, this is quite common. In another uh, very uh, recent study in Zimbabwe, uh, a quarter of HIV infected children in a cohort that was followed, a cohort of about 202 children, uh, who were already ART, I uh, mean, experienced, you know, I mean, established on ART, actually experienced chronic uh, respiratory symptoms, even with good viral control in the majority. So, no try in this, I mean, in, the, in that cohort, in the Zimbabwean study, actually. Uh, had uh, any TB upon all the investigations and all the TB microbiological uh, investigations that were done. None of these children actually had uh, 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 TB, but uh, most of those, in, in most cases, these children would be, be treated for, for TB. So uh, what are some of the, the causes of this chronic cough that can be observed with uh, children? Dr. Uh, can I Can I ask you to summarize the remaining responses in about, a minute, maybe. <laughs> Sorry to to rush you. Would that be okay? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I think I just wanted to also highlight that uh, the, the the main causes of this will be, you know, the delay in the ARV initiation at times results in these children developing uh, multi upper and uh, lower respiratory tract infections. At times, uh, you have uh, previous treatment for TB leaves every, uh, leave the, the children with uh, uh, obstructive airway conditions. And uh, even the stunting that this child presented with uh, is also another um, uh, risk factor for developing uh, uh, you know, a chronic lung condition. So uh, effectively, the child was treated, so the child might not really have been having TB, but now presenting with sick killers that are responsible for this uh, uh, lung infection. Uh, on her second question, uh, DTG uh, not re uh, responding, I think one of the things that I need to understand here is that this child has been 10 years on treatment and long-term exposure to failing, a failing first-line regimen for a child like this one, I mean, result to the, the, the possibility of developing multiple uh, drug resistance and I might be with, uh, with terms. So one of the things that we need to, to note here is that the, the response that they got when they introduced the child on, I mean, on AZT Lupina V, uh, I mean, on, on DTG, DTG initially before uh, the child couldn't suppress anymore. Uh, again, they, this child might have actually developed a multi drug resistance. And since they have collected um, a resistant test result, I think that is going to effectively guide uh, the treatment uh, options for this child because. If the child has developed uh, multiple terms, there's a high risk that uh, the, more, the, 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 the backbone that they are using now cannot be more effective because those backbones would have already, which are all nucleotide reverse uh, transcriptase inhibitors, might have already been all resistant to what this child is taking for since the child has been on a, a long filling regimen. So uh, I think uh, if they get the results of the, 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 the resistant test, it might guide the team better. And surely they might, they might be having to move that child from uh, an AZT uh, backbone to uh, a tenophobia backbone uh, in case, uh, depending on what the, the results will show them. Might be, in, we, we, we can answer more questions that will be posed uh, to, more, to clarify more uh, her case. Thank you and over Agnes. Thank you, Dr. Tanga. Sorry to put you in a difficult position where we ask all these questions, but we don't give you enough time to respond. My sincere apologies for that. We'll take that into account with our next webinar. Can I uh, move very swiftly now to uh, Dr. Vindu to present her case? Dr. Vindu is a program manager for Children AIDS Program at Hill Africa Hospital in the DRC. Thank you so much, Agnes. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Ella Livindu, uh, the Children AIDS Program 
manager at Hill Africa Hospital in DRC. I'm glad to present you uh, this case. It's about a 70 year old female, often then living in a child headed house with one older sister and four young siblings as her only support system. Diagnosed with HIV at three years old, she is fully disclosed to and openly living with HIV. Both parents were HIV positive, but has passed away and none of the siblings are positive. She left school after the parent's death and had no orphan and vulnerable children support apart from clinical support. We followed her medically, but we do not have a social approach to support socioeconomic vulnerable children and adolescents. Next. But currently is living in a slum area and vulnerable to other diseases. Periodically presents with other problem associated with poor living condition like diarrhea. But since 2010, she had a musculoskeletal and known disease. And this it was before initiated of art. Until now, we have been trying to pro provide care and treatment, but we have not been able to resolve her presenting condition. She had problems of sleeping and has attended multiple consultation and hospitalization to have sedatives. We did many investigations, included biopsy, x-ray, blood tests. I can add here that we did a, a rheumatic factor test, which was normal on 2013. And also we did C-reactive protein tests, I can say every year, but the abnormal was observed in 2018. But we did also a retesting when we saw that many things, many HIV markers was normal. But regularly we are doing liver and kidney tests without any conclusion. We don't have the diagnosis. Next. Clinically, we can say on 2009, she presenting with a, a severe malnutrition and sepsis, which was regulated. And we did the test, the PCR, which was negative, and the CD4 count. We put her on uh, cotrimoxazole. On 2010, then she present the painful muscles and painful joint with a general lymphadenopathy. We thought that it can be a TB and we did the chest X-ray, which was negative for TB. And you can see we did also the CD4 counts, which was 987. And we initiate anti-TB for six months, which cannot change the symptom. She continues the same symptom. And at uh, 2017, now we have them, we get the machine and we did the viral load, which was normal, but we continue with uh, uh, azt 3 tc and nevirapine associated with cotrimoxazole. On 2018, then the left nodes appeared on the thigh, which was very, very painful, and she lost the waist. Then we regulated the waste with uh, an integrated management of severe malnutrition, which is the part of our treatment. And we retest. Uh, we found that she's, uh, she's still positive, she's HIV positive. We did the biopsy, which shows an inflammatory uh, condition. And she continued with uh, DOVN and cotrimoxazole because. Uh, we thought that all the, the tests for HIV was normal, but no change in symptom. And sometimes she have fever. But on 2020, we switched to tenofovilamivir and dolitegravir according to the national program. And now, even on 2021, 20, we did the viral load, which was uh, 
and the four 40, 40 copies. And the CD4 is in the normal range. So this was the situation. Uh, she will do the, the viral load on uh, October. Next slide. The key challenge is uh, in our setting, we were, we have limited resources and equipment to diagnose and inform appropriate management of rare conditions like this. Ideally, this would require even an MRI scan or CT scan, but at the moment we can only do X-ray. We can only do our best to manage and alleviate symptom, but we still don't know what the root problem is. We learn many things from this case, as well as good adherence to treatment and viral load suppression. We need to understand and screen for other factors that may affect the client's health. When faced with clients like this, the best we can do is to manage and alleviate symptom so they can have the best quality of life. We need to think about living conditions and other factors that may impact the client's health and link them to other support systems. Next, uh, our question is, we would like to hear from others and the panelists who might have seen similar cases in the absence of CT and MRI scans. How could this case be best managed? Is, is it possible to have an extra pulmonary TB with normal viral load and CD4 result? The third one is which kind of disease can have the same presentation apart from immunosuppression? And the fourth one is did heart hit sign of TB or sign for other diseases? Thank you. Yeah, I think thank you very much. I think that's an excellent presentation and really compliments the you know the team itself really you know to get such a difficult patient biologically suppressed for such a long time is really testament to amount of you know effort that the clinics put uh, you know and, and your staff have been putting in terms of getting this patient uh, together. So I think the two things I just want to do highlight is one I think we do have a, a really at risk child. I mean she was you know, a teenager, she is living in a child-headed household, and she looks like she is the one who's really in charge of this whole household. You know, she started treatment very earlier, and she is the only one on antiretroviral treatment in the family. So it's extremely isolating uh, for her. Um, in addition to that, she has she's had to deal with the you know death of both uh, family members, you know, both the, both the parents. And has had this lack of support from the additional family and and, and social support that she uh, she has. So you know it's a really really difficult situation for this child. But she has actually managed to maintain and continue taking her treatment and maintain uh, some degree of biological uh, uh, suppression. So the one thing I would one like to put into the into the mix is really to you know acknowledge the difficult situation that this patient is in, and also you know, to highlight you know, the mental health issues that may be underlining some of these uh, you know, complaints that this child has had. And I think you know, we do need to, sometimes we do, um, you know, we, we don't delve into the mental health issues and adequately treat it. So I think the one thing is, you know, even if you know, all these symptoms are not entirely related to mental health, I think that's one thing that needs to be addressed and, and to see whether there's an overlay of uh, you know, either depression or anxiety that's, uh, that, that's adding to the symptoms and the, the feeling, um, you know, the, 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 the problems that this child has had. The second thing is, I think, in terms of um, you know, the, what, uh, the underlying pathology and if this is, a, is, is actually a pathological issue from there. The, the one thing I, I do need to say is, you know, this child has been sick you know, and had these symptoms for quite a long time. 
Um, so certainly in terms of, you know, if this was TB or this was a malignancy, I would have expected it to have, you know, really deteriorated from now. So I'm, you know, very, it's, you know, in terms of the progression, it seems very unlikely that this is, you know, a, a severe infective or a malignant uh, process. So that these you know, are the one things that you, you do need to take in account, especially if you have these inflammatory markers that are going, you know, up and down. And we do see that with, um, you know, HIV infected child is your, uh, you know, rheumatic uh, uh, condition. So either uh, rheumatic uh, uh, joint disease or in, in children, uh, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, or some sort of, uh, uh, you know, uh, inflammatory syndromes like dermatomyositis that may uh, result. So, you know, one of the things that we will do is look for anti-nuclear factor and other features of, uh, of, of inflammatory uh, diseases uh, that are there. Um, and then, and then the other thing is is recurrent infections that that uh, you know that may be precipitating. So those lymph nodes that you found, you know, may just be uh, an acute lymphadenitis that uh, that maybe have been a bacterial from that situation that the, this child is is finding. So I think I, I support. I mean, the, the good thing is she's biologically suppressed. You need to maintain that. Um, you know, you need to be actively involved in terms of ensuring that her mental health has been assessed and addressed, and 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 you support that. Uh, in terms of investigation, I, I would lean towards an inflammatory resp uh, inflammatory condition, um, and and often we you know in these kids with chronic. Um, uh, bo you know, joint pain and, and bone pain and, and muscle pain without obvious arthritis. Uh, you know, conditions like fibromyalgia is something that we consider, which you know really requires chronic uh, pain relief and, and pain control um, as ultimately the, the, the control for this child. So I'll leave it at that. And then I don't know if there's any other questions. I think the one thing I wanted to ask was, you know, if there's any obvious evidence of uh, an arthritis, or is this just arthralgia that this patient is, is, is experiencing? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Archery. Thank you. And then I'm going to uh, uh, hand over very quickly again to Elizabeth Ngova, sister in charge at the OI clinic at Morganstown Mission Hospital in Zimbabwe. Hello. Hello. Hello, Elizabeth, please go ahead. We can hear you. Hello, you can hear me. Okay, thank you. Yes. I'm Elizabeth yes. Mugova, sister in charge Morgan, at OI Clinic in Morgan Mission Hospital, Zimbabwe. And I'm presenting this first slide number two. Can I have slide number two? Uh, if good. I'm presenting a case of a two-year-old boy who is, li who is living with grandparents in a rural community in Zimbabwe. And the grandparents are patient farmers who are economically challenged. The child tested HIV positive when he was two years old. That was October, 29 October 2021. And the, the father and the father of the child is of no fixed abode, and the mother is residing in Botswana. And the, they are HIV status is not known. And we are not sure whether the PMGCP interventions were done. So the disclosure has been done very well to the grandparents. And there's no other family member within the family with known HIV status. Continue, another slide. In, uh, I, the, on the 29th of October 2021, the, the child presented with cough, bilateral kicking or edema of lower limbs, descended abdomen, and old men's face, and low weight of 8 kgs. The child was tested for HIV and was positive. The TB lamp investigated and chest x ray was done, and the child was TB positive. To the investigations done. The child was on the very day admitted in children's ward in the pediatric ward 
and was managed. A was diagnosed with TB, malnutrition, which was severe malnutrition, which was marasmic kwashioko, and HIV positive. So the the child was admitted and he managed for nutritional treatment and was commenced on the, the therapeutic feeds and was also commenced on anti-TB medicines for six months and she was given cotrimoxal so five meals to eat for to prevent infection and also to combat infection and was to continue with cotrimoxal so he is a prophylactic measure then the on the 16th and that was deferred just because the child was being managed for nutrition and malnutrition and tb and on the 16th of november the child was clinically improving and was initiated on, on, on art that was abacava and lamivudine then plus lopinova and retinova and the child was managed as an outpatient and was being reviewed on a monthly basis he, then on on the in April, the child was attended at outpatient department, and he had completed anti TB clinically looking well, very well, and he has to continue with abaca valamidine, and lopinov and retinova, otrimoxazo, and nutritional diet encouraged. He, we continued to manage the the child and the reviewing the, the child and giving medication package body weight, reviewing the art medication and giving package body weight. Then on the 21st of May 2021, the viral load was done. It is the viral load, first viral load, 60 months post, post art initiation. And the, the viral load was 2,682, which which means this, this, this uh, and suppression. Continue another slide. Can we continue? Then uh, the challenges in the management of a young child with comorbidities. Morbidities. We are not sure what to prioritize or what what we are supposed to be treated first. And the child is still burden because she has she, she had multiple conditions. He had to take the art, he had to take anti TB medications and he malnutrition therapeutic feeds. And the child also the, the art medications and the TB medications, they are not child friendly. I mean the formulations, they and they were not user friendly. The, the child's age. Then the information around treatment can be a lot uh, to take in a difficult and difficult for the grandparents to understand because the, the, of the multiple conditions we had to give uh, many medicines. So it was very difficult for the grandparents to grasp the information. Can we continue? Continue another slide. What we have learned from this case, an treatment for caregivers is critical, especially if caregivers are not living with HIV and or if the caregivers are old, like this case, and the men, men not fully understand the importance of adherence and the ensuring suppression, viral suppression. Then the community workers should continuously continuously monitor children, especially those living with guardians, to screen for TB and to provide early referrals. The health providers are encouraged to monitor all children and adolescents for community-acquired infections, such as TB as well as malnutrition and other uh, comorbidities. And uh, on this case, the community at large, we encourage them. We have learned that the community at large should, at large should know to, to, to do screening and the early referrals for the benefit of the community and the adult, the adults and adolescents. Can we continue? Then the question for the, the expert panel 
is the op optimal treatment for a child of this weight? Is this the optimal treatment for a child for this weight? Was the client managed according to operating standards? How is a child with comorbidities of HIV, TB, and malnutrition managed in order of priority? Great. Thank you. I think, thank you. And thanks again, a great presentation. And again, I think, you know, highlights some of those difficult patients which, which we have. And, you know, the, the one thing that we, you know, we are seeing a lot of is this combination of acute, severe acute malnutrition, HIV and, and TB, you know, which interplay itself together to present the, you know, in these patients. So I, mean, I think one of the things just to highlight in terms of the, the presentation, I think one of the, you know, in terms of your, your TB treatment and your antiretroviral treatment, I think the one thing to, to rem remember is, you know, that you need to do, you do need to adjust the doses of the medication and uh, uh, the medication itself. So in this patient, you know, because he was on a lopinavir, a tonavir based regimen. Um, so I'm assuming that, that uh, because he was on a rifampicin based TB treatment, he should have uh, had a, you know, super boosting. Uh, so he would have received additional ritonavir with the lopinavir tonava, and that will counteract that effect of uh, the rifampicin on decreasing the levels of lopinavir tonava. So if you don't do that, what happens is you end up with suboptimal levels of lopinavir tonava, and you, you know, it creates uh, issues related to adherence, uh, to, uh, to resistance to the lopinavir tonava. And many of the kids that we see now, you know, who have high level resistance to lupinavir tonava have been exposed to TB medication before and they haven't had the super boosting of the, the TB treatment. I mean, the difficulty with that is, is one is the availability of the lupinavir, you know, ritonavir super boosting and the palatability of giving both, you know, lupinavir ritonavir, if you're using the, the syrup or you're using the pellets is, you know, the, the palatability of it. And then you have to use additional uh, ritonavir powder or syrup uh, to that, which is additionally, you know, not as uh, as palatable, palatable as other formulations, as you've as you mentioned. So, you know, if you look at, you know, optimized treatment regimens and, and, and the move towards uh, dolitegavir-based regimens, you know, in this child, you know, potentially if you've got the dolitegavir dispersible tablet, um, you know, that would give you an easier option and a once daily option. Uh, but again, to highlight, you know, when he's on the TB treatment and the rifampicin-based TB treatment that dolitegravir has to be given twice daily as opposed to once daily. So you'll give the same dose that we're using once daily and you'll give it morning and evening as opposed to you know, evening only uh, for, for this child. Um, the second thing is, I think your question was really around you know, you know, what to prioritize with this treatment. And again, I think it, it does depend on whether you consider this to be what we call, you know, complicated severe acute malnutrition versus uncomplicated severe acute malnutrition. And certainly, you know, your, our complicated severe acute malnutrition, with, which this kid, you know, sounds like he had edema, he had some other, you know, uh, uh, diarrhea and other comorbidities at that time and will require admission. In those patients, we often will delay the ART initiation um, until the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, until that acute stabilization period is over. So, and that usually takes about a week or two to happen. Um, and, and, and the patient is able to uh, tolerate a, an oral treatment and is able to, to, to take in the oral treatment. Um, and 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 after that, and it, but if it's an uncomplicated severe acute, acute malnutrition, and you treating as an outpatient, there should be no uh, uh, delay in terms of starting the antiretroviral treatment in relationship to the uh, to to the the, the malnutrition. In terms of TB treatment and the and the acute malnutrition, I think you know, you've noted that the difficulty really is around that. Uh, pull burden that happens and really around trying to uh, you know get patients to adjust to that larger number of different treatment that they do need to take. Um, however, the WHO guideline has changed and previously we did recommend that you delay the ART initiation uh, and start the TB treatments uh, first and then start the antiretroviral treatment like two weeks later or a month later. And I you know we looked at the data and the data 
uh, you know, showed that there was no mortality risk with starting the treatment be, uh, together and the risk of iris, which is the, you know, the major issue that you're worried about, um, is actually quite small. So the current recommendation is that we don't delay uh, uh, ART initiation in patients with TB treatment. And you can start it, you know, around the same time um, that you start the, the, the TB medication. Um, again, I think the main thing that you need to to look at is 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 really around the pull burden and the you know the 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 side effect profile. And and one of the major things, especially early on when you're starting antiretroviral treatment and TB treatment, is that nausea and vomiting that the majority of patients get with both TB treatment and antiretroviral treatment. So I think you know those are the things that you need to address and speak to the family about and and work with them uh, through that. Um, so I think just to highlight, um, you know, uh, for for complicated TB treatment, for complicated severe acute malnutrition, you do want to get them to to get through that acute stabilization phase uh, before you start to start your antiretroviral treatment. But other than that, you know, starting it as soon as possible and get them on the way uh, to 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 help uh, is important. Um, am I forgetting anything? Uh, yeah, and I think just that, that support, especially if it's an elderly uh, caregiver, is extremely important and constantly, you know, reinforcing what you've been uh, telling them. It's, it's this constant repetition of the same thing is, is extremely important. Oh, yeah, sorry. But one other thing is, you know, we're often giving, you know, um, uh, multivitamins and other medications for, for these children. And if you look at your ready-to-use uh, feeds that we use for severe acute malnutrition, you know, the ready-to-use feeds include uh, many of these multivitamins with it. So, you know, you can get away with, you know, many of the other additional treat treatments that uh, uh, in these patients, if you're using some of these supplemental feeds uh, that include, uh, you know, multivitamin and iron and the rest of it. Um, yeah, so I, th I hope I've answered um, all of the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Archery. And uh, I was going to also then ask you to, to give yeah, us okay. a, a I'll, peek. I'll yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And yeah, so I think, thank you. I, th I think, again, I mean, this, this forum really is an excellent forum for, you know, sharing, you know, best practices and the difficulties that we often face as clinicians when we out in the field. Um, I mean, I, th I think what came out strongly is, you know, we often forced into doing things that we don't really want to do. Um, you know, the first two presentations, they, you know, stock out, drove, you know, many of the decisions that we we had to make. And they often difficult decisions uh, to make. Um, so we we try to make the best out of those. And and again, I think I put some comments about some you know some general uh, principles in terms of when you're choosing alternative medications when you have these uh, these stockouts. Um, it, the other thing for me is is really uh, you know patients uh, being patients with the patient with the, with the patients that we have and the, the the families that we have and working with the families to get them over these periods where they have difficulty with uh you know with with the uh, uh you know with the, the difficulties with taking medication and 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 from my side i think one of the other things is really to think about the mental health issues with not only the patient and you know the 17 year old girl with a chronic you know body pain you know it may just all be uh, you know issues around you know, depression and other things that she may be facing, but not also you know the the caregivers and the family members that have to be in this difficult situation and dealing with these uh, multiple different issues that they need to take into consideration. So I think uh, addressing these mental health issues and the the support that these uh, patients and families need go a long way with going together with the medical uh, treatment and the medical. Uh, paradigm that we're quite you know comfortable with with administering. So again, thank you very much and, and excellent presentations. Um, and 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 really, we learn a lot from these these presentations that you bring to our forum. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Archery, and thank you, everyone. Uh, Elizabeth, if you're still there, if I can ask you to answer Rumi Zai's question in the 
Q&A, that would be great. Other than that, I did have uh, three, as I'm closing, saying goodbye, it literally will take you two minutes. I do, we do have a couple of other questions that we would like to ask you in the poll. So I will ask, as I'm talking, I will ask Tech to ask the questions. And then uh, if you could just respond to that, those two questions for us, that would be very helpful. Um, and uh, yeah, so just a huge thank you, uh, first of all, to our health providers for taking the time and effort to prepare uh, the cases that they've presented today. And in that, I also want to really thank Christopher Mulotta, who's in the background somewhere, who's helped us in preparing these cases. And then most of all as well, huge thank you to our panelists for the wise words. And um, I mean, I think the big lesson is we need more time for this. So we'll probably do less cases and do it properly in future rather than rush through things. But I certainly have learned quite a lot and I hope you have too. So if you could answer those two questions in the uh, chat box for us. Uh, question number one, what comorbidities do you experience most pre uh, present more uh, or do you experience the most present, present more often in your facility when managing pediatric HIV? And question number two, in your health facility, oh, sorry, in our health facility, we have access to screening tools, equipment, and reagents to test for comorbidities. So if you could answer um, those questions for us before you leave, that would be great. And then the other thing we were going to do was to share a video with you, which we shared at the last one. So in case you missed the, our last session, we have a great video on, um, uh, which was produced by Pata in, in, in an effort to demonstrate the critical role that we as health providers play in providing, uh, in support, in enabling um, caregivers in the transition and treatment literacy process. As Mo was saying, you have to consider the family setup and the family support. Uh, so that video will, will really be helpful for health providers in terms of engaging with health providers and um, promoting literacy. If you can't uh, watch it today, don't worry, we'll share it in our social media, it's on our website, it's also on our Linking and Learn Learning Hub. But on that note, I really would like to thank you all. I don't know if we have any, uh, yes, fantastic, everyone has answered. Thank you so much. So question number one, the most common, not surprising is TB. And interestingly, I see acute malnutrition is coming second. So that's uh, something to note and to consider in future, to, talking about in future sessions. Uh, and then for question number two, neck and neck, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, just less than half say, yes, you have access to screening tools and equipment, which is not ideal really, less than half. That's, um, but at this moment, I think we've heard some words of wisdom from uh, Dr. Archery in where you don't have these resources in the messages that he put in, in the Q&A, there are ways to try and do the best that you can. Um, and so, yeah, on that note, I uh, would really just like to say thank you very much, everyone. Really appreciate your support, all your interaction and your questions. And until the next real webinar, which is um, around the same time as our summit, and I think it's the 22nd or 23rd of uh, November at the summit. So don't miss it. Please be there. We will uh, send communication round. So you know exactly what date and um, so you know what time exactly it will be at. Um, otherwise, thank you very much. Please enjoy the video if you can um, and see you soon.